teacher and student become mother and son. Yeah, you can adopt me. A heartwarming story of finding family in the classroom. I needed him probably as much or more than he needed me. Plus, Kathy Lee Gifford shares her passion for Israel. I've been going to the Holy Land since I was 17 years old. And for the Jewish roots of our Christian faith. Those stories and more on today's 700 Club Interactive. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. Greg Lowry believes the next great revival will start in California, and he might be right. More than 10,000 people made professions of faith during Pastor Lowry's social harvest event. That was last weekend. The three-day event was held at Angel Stadium in Anaheim, California. It drew nearly 100,000 people with another 325,000 watching online or on Facebook Live. Amazing. <laughs> Indeed. Well, you might remember that in the days leading up to the event, a controversy surrounding Pastor Lowry's billboard, which looked like this, became a national story. A local real estate company removed Lowry's billboards from two malls after receiving complaints and one serious threat, all because the ads featured an image of Lowry holding a Bible. The controversy turned into a social media campaign, hashtag Stand With The Bible. Attendees were encouraged to bring their Bibles to make a public show of their solidarity with the Word of God. And Lori made that a key part of the event. If you have a Bible, I want you to hold up the Bible. I want you to stand up and hold up the Bible. If you have an app on your phone, that counts. If you have an app on your tablet device, that counts. Hold up your Bible. We stand with the Word of God here at the SoCal Harvest. Gotta love him. At the end of each night service, thousands responded to Lori's invitation to accept Christ by walking onto the field at Angel Stadium to pray with a Harvest team member or by indicating their faith decision through the Social, social Harvest live internet broadcast. You know, sometimes when somebody stands up to just complain about nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nothing. It works. <laughs> it works for the good. It gives <laughs> and more it, attention yes, to, to the event itself. It surely did in this. And, you know, I, I mean, I, there are so many people in the United States, whether they're regular churchgoers or not, mm -hmm. who attempt to live by the book Absolutely. and care about Absolutely. possessing one and being able to have the freedom to read it. We stand yeah. with the Bible. Amen. Well, the picture titled Calvary was painted in 2006 and it's going viral again. A woman posted it recently on Facebook after seeing it in the artist's shop saying she thinks the painting should be, quote, hung in every rehab center, jail and hospital yard. ER. The painting, as you see there, is a dramatic depiction of what appears to be a heroin addict shooting up with Jesus, with the drug. The addict uses a syringe to stick a needle into what looks like the arm of Jesus, who is standing behind him with an expression of agony. The painting is the work of Christian artist Stephen Sawyer. CBN News spoke to Sawyer, who said, some people see the junkie shooting up, some people see the junkie shooting up in Jesus' arm. But the truth is, I was trying to demonstrate the fact that God does live inside us, and those two arms are the same arm, adding, when you hurt yourself, you also hurt God. Sawyer says the addict in the painting is a former user who's now clean and helping others who've been damaged by drugs. Powerful image. It is. Scripture says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so he does live yeah. there. And the, the, the choices we make, especially when they go against us as mm -hmm. his children and his creation, do wound the heart of God. Indeed, yeah. indeed. It does make him cry. Rick Warren Saddleback Church just reached a major milestone. It's in its 38-year history, when its members watched the baptism of, get this, the 50,000th person into wow. the body of Christ. In an email to <laughs> members, Pastor Warren wrote, imagine all the amazing personal stories of changed lives behind that number. 50,000 individual lives transformed by Jesus since Saddleback Church began. This is unprecedented in history. You are likely one of those stories of a changed life.
Now to celebrate the big day, all 16 locations of Saddleback Church baptized people after each service. And to show you how many years Pastor Warren's, Pastor Warren's been baptizing people, here's what he looks like now. And here's the way he looked way <laughs> back when. 50,000 people ago. It's been a long journey. <laughs> That's right. That is right. Well, congratulations to Saddleback Church. Yeah. Powerful ministry making an impact in many different places, not just on Sunday morning. You got that right. The purpose driven life made him wow. worldwide. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, here's a fun story. A Chicago nuns pitch is going viral. The arm on this woman's unbelievable. The White Sox <laughs> team tweeted it was one of the most impressive, impressive first pitches of all time. Uh, last all time. weekend, <laughs> Sister Mary Jo Sobiet confidently marched toward the mound. You see her there for the ceremonial <laughs> opening of the Royals White Sox game. You got her wearing own, <laughs> you got her I own love it. <laughs> there you see, wearing her habit and a, a Marian Catholic High School jersey, she pointed to heaven and next the nun surprises everyone by doing a fancy arm bounce trick, a routine that put her quote in motion. And finally, Sister Mary Jo throws a perfect strike. <laughs> wow. I mean, what an arm, what form. And here are some fun facts about Sister Mary Jo. She played volleyball and softball in college. She coached sports at Marion Catholic High School. She says the number on the back of her jersey 60 is the speed <laughs> of her fastball. I, Do you love, I mean, she's probably the only nun in history with a fastball. Oh, and when, when asked why she was picked to represent the high school at the big game, she laughed and said it was because of her <laughs> and agility. I love this woman. I would, if I lived near her, we'd be friends. I tell you, I'm a Catholic school kid. I had no nun like that. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. No, I had some nuns with good arms, but it wasn't about pitching. No, no. <laughs> yes, yes. I got that too. <laughs> well, Kathy Lee Gifford is a multi-talented performer. The secret of her success is bringing passion to everything she does, including how she lives out her faith. I sat down with Kathy Lee to talk about her book, The Rock, The Road, and The Rabbi. When I closed my eyes and held my very breath and let you love me to death. From the recording studio. That remains yeah. to be seen. I'm going to sing it later in the show. But to the television studio. We went, we went Kathy Lee Hampton. Gifford yep. is an all around and, entertainer with and, uh, unmatched yeah, passion. Follow your joy and it will lead to God's purpose for your life. And I have a mantra, which is my joy is non-negotiable. <laughs> at the same time, the fierce army of the Philistines had been camped at the Valley of Ella for 40 days. Gifford is a gifted performer who is also passionate about her faith. You can see it in the pages of her latest bestseller, The Rock, The Road, and The Rabbi. What inspired you to want to tackle this? You've written best-selling books already. What inspired this? I've been going to Israel, been going to the Holy Land since I was 17 years old. I was a big Bible nerd from, from the time I became a Christian when I was 12 years old. <laughs> and uh, this was back in the 70s, and it was the first Jerusalem conference on biblical prophecy. Mm. And my father, as my, as my graduation gift from high school, get, got tickets for my mom and me to go to um, Israel and attend that. Mm. And I was thrilled. I mean, I missed my high school graduation. I could have cared less. I could have missed high school. I could have <laughs> wow. cared less. I always was anxious to get to the Holy Land and be where everything happened mm. and just um, soak it in. These are snapshots from one of her trips to the Holy Land with Rabbi Jason Sobel, who helped her to write the book. In 2012, my husband and I went on our, our first, what we call a rabbinical trip. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's when everything changed for me. And when I started really studying the way the Messianic rabbis mm -hmm. teach, mm -hmm. because the, the Word of God was written by Middle Easterners for Middle Easterners. Yeah. And when we try to apply our Western mindset or mm -hmm. traditions or, or thought process or, uh, towards that, it never works. Mm -hmm. we, we, we have to go back to who they were yeah. and what was happening at the time that it happened. And we have to understand what the languages truly meant. Most people think that Jesus was a carpenter. Well, not according to the, the Greek in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The word for what Jesus and Joseph did was tekton, T-E-K-T-O-N. Yeah. And that means either builder 
or it means architect. Well, Jesus was the architect of all of creation, so that would make sense. And if I'm going to base my entire life on something, mm -hmm. I have to know what it really means. Many people call themselves Christians. They've never even read the Bible, much less know what it says. Kathy Lee aims to make the pages of the Bible come to life and encourage people to read it more. If you know Israel, there's like a three mile circumference around the temple. Everything is about worship at the temple. Everything was about the spilling of blood for the atoning of sins in the temple. Those shepherds were Levitical priests, yeah. shepherds. Mm -hmm. And those, those, um, those lambs were born for the same reason that Jesus was in Bethlehem, right there, to be sacrificed for the sins <laughs> of, of the people. Mm -hmm. And what did they do? What did they do to the lambs as soon as, they, as soon as they were born? They wrapped them in swaddling clothes and laid them in mangers. This is, a, this is the kind of journey we go on in the Rock the Road and the Rabbi. It is so. And I hope it ignites people's faith. We are so lukewarm. Uh, so lukewarm in our society today. Our battery is like on, I think on like, you know, critical mass or something. And because we're not understanding what the word of God really says, mm -hmm. therefore we're not applying it properly to our, in our own daily lives. Absolutely. And we're living half of our faith out because we're not living our Jewish part. Yeah. And I think you say it really profoundly when you're talking about how it came alive for your husband. Yes. Religion. Versus yes. relationship. I don't want religion in my life. <laughs> I don't want religion. I want relationship with the living God. Is there a favorite place for mm. you to visit since you've been so many times? If you were going and could go to one place, mm. what would you say go? Oh, it, that's an impossible question mm. to answer. I um, adore En Gedi because so much of our life is, um, is in desert. So much of our life does involve suffering. Mm -hmm. And David suffered so, uh, think about it, as a, as a young man, probably 12 to 14 years old, he was anointed by, by uh, Samuel to be king. Yeah. When did he actually become king? When he was 30. 30. <laughs> 30. That's a long time to wait on God yeah. and half the time to be separated from his loved ones and his family and hiding in caves from King Saul who wanted to kill him. Here is also a reminder of God's provision an oasis in the desert for all who believe. Fascinating. She is Fascinating. amazing. She yeah. certainly sent me back to the Bible yeah. <laughs> following that interview. Well, th that's the book. We need to get <laughs> yes. it. The, the, the Road, the Rabbi is actually now once again back on the New York Times bestseller awesome. list. It's been out for a few months, but it's back on the charts again. It drives people to the word. You got that right. Go get that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, coming up, a teacher remembers a student who wasn't just trying to get good grades. He was trying to find a family. I said, well, if you're going to be my kid, you know, if you was ever my kid, you have to be good. And he said, for how long? And I said, forever. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> Hear an inspirational story that began in a classroom and ended in an adoption center. That's next. Dr. Benny Berry is a teacher whose students love her. In fact, a few joked they wanted her to be their mother. But as she soon found out, one of her students wasn't kidding. Some days I felt upset, angry, lost. They taking me from my safe place and placing me in a home with strangers. That, I mean, I didn't have any help or anyone to turn to or anything like that. Anthony was placed in foster care when he was six years old due to his birth mom's drug use while pregnant with his baby sister. He knew about God's love through his grandmother and tried to stay hopeful in a tough situation. I prayed sometimes when I was feeling down or, and then other days I questioned him, why am I here? Why, why can't I find anyone to love me? Why can't I go back home? He lived in group homes for nine years, hoping to be adopted, yet afraid of being let down. I didn't get my hopes up for anything, basically, because I didn't want to get my hopes up too high and it not happen. Because deep down, I wanted it to work. I wanted to get out the system. I didn't want to deal with the bonds of being a ward of the state anymore. I just wanted you know, have a loving family, a forever home. At 15 years old and after a failed adoption, he began losing hope. He got in trouble at his high school and was sent to Pathways Alternative School, 
where he met Dr. Benny Berry, a teacher at the school. And he came there and he volunteered to say the pledge at the beginning of the day. He volunteered, he was in ROTC at his home campus. He volunteered to hang the flag. I was impressed. Uh, I felt like, oh, this kid is a leader. This kid is a leader. He's different from the rest. He's, he's, he has initiative. Benny was single and had no children of her own. In class, students joked that they loved Dr. Barry and wished she was their mom. Anthony jumped in and wasn't joking. The discussion went to families. And some of the kids are saying, well, I've been trying to get Miss Barry to take me home. And, and so Anthony said, oh, you can take me home for real. And I said, well, no, you have, you know, your parents are doing the best. Respect your parents the way you respect me and it will, you'll be okay. And he's like, no, really, I'm in foster care. And so uh, a couple of students and myself, we didn't know. And we kind of gasped, like, really, you're in foster care? I actually was like, yeah, you can adopt me. I mean, w will you, or have you thought about adoption or? You know, then we got deeper into the conversation. And, and I said, well, if you're going to be my kid, you know, if you was ever my kid, you have to be good. And he said, for how long? And I said, forever, God, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> so uh, he said, well, you can, you know, look me up. I'm, I'm, I can be adopted. You know, you can take me home. Anthony gave Benny his information and the adoption website. I had never planned on adopting uh, because I didn't know. I didn't know the process for adopting. Only thing I knew about adoption is what I've seen on like a Lifetime movie. I never really believed, I'll say in the first few days, that it was something that I could do. It came time for me to leave Pathways and I was like, don't you forget about me and she didn't forget. When it became more real, I had to. I had to pray about everything. Um, I asked God to order my steps, everything that I want to do. I was like, okay, Lord, show me that what I'm doing is not just raw emotion. It is what I really should do. So I felt like God was showing me, yes, this is what you need to do, step by step, ordering it, ordained. To Benny's amazement, there were no roadblocks to the application process, and soon they began a trial adoption period. Later that year, on National Adoption Day 2017, Benny officially adopted Anthony. I was very nervous. It was, you know, all the anxiety and the tension, like, this is really happening. Today's the day. I actually, we both couldn't sleep the, the night before. We spent most of the time talking to each other. So that was a very good bonding period. National Adoption Day was an emotional day. My name was put on his birth certificate. His name was officially changed. It became real on that day. Everything we had prayed for, every step that I had asked God to order, we're now at the end of the road. It's over, it is official. We are a family. Nobody can change. You me the trait that best defines this new family of two is gratitude for one another and to God who opened the door and their hearts. He's bringing us all the way, he's carrying us. Like he carried cross, he's carrying us on his back. But I'm thankful for her just loving me and taking a 16 year old, well 15 going on 16 year old boy into her home, a troubled boy at that. I love it, it's something that I never thought I would have. I'm happy. For someone my age to get adopted, it, you know, it's very rare. I didn't know that I could love somebody so much besides my parents. I needed him probably as much or more than he needed me. I don't tell him a lot because I don't, I don't want to think he has the upper hand. <laughs> but I am more than proud of him. I thank God for the opportunity to help mold somebody who I know is going to do wonderful things. 
You know, when God orchestrates something, it's so right on every level, isn't it? I mean, for Benny and Anthony, they are just the recipients of what Scripture says. God puts the lonely in families. And it wasn't, it wasn't just for Anthony. Benny got blessed, too. And she says she needed it more than she realized she did. You know, we're meant to be in family. And hats off to you, Benny, for taking a troubled 15-year-old boy, not just into your home, into your heart. Yes, <laughs> Beautiful to see. Great story. I yeah. love it. It's I love it. It's the story of Jesus adopting us. That Amen. It really is. Amen. It really is. Mm -hmm. Well, up next, prayer cards are flooding Pennsylvania Avenue, and it's all thanks to the efforts of a congressman's wife. God was doing something bigger than I ever imagined. In fact, those prayers are winding up inside the Oval Office and on the president's desk. CBN News has the story when we come back. A prayer movement started by one congressman and his wife is gaining national momentum. Mike and Tracy Boss asked constituents to send prayers to the president. Today, they're delivering 100 prayer cards a month to the White House. And as Abigail Robertson reports, the president is reading them. When Tracy Boss first set up a P.O. box for people in her district to send prayers to the president, she was hesitant to go back and check it, fearing no one would send anything. But to her great surprise, Hundreds of prayers poured in. That was really a blessing to me. And, uh, and then I knew that um, God was doing something bigger than I ever imagined. The school in Philadelphia. Tracy first came up with the idea when she and her husband, Mike, attended the 2017 GOP retreat in Philadelphia. We are the people! There was so much protest going on and so much anger and just pure ugliness. Tracy wanted to do something to encourage the new commander in chief. I just kept praying, God, what can I do? What can I do? And the prayer card came to my mind that we could just simply have people in my life, friends and family members, just to send a little prayer of encouragement to the president. Mr. President and Vice President praying for God's blessings. On they set a goal of a hundred prayers and asked people to send them on three by five note cards. Lubbock, Texas. Six weeks later, Narco, California. They have received almost 300. Her husband asked a White House liaison to deliver them to President Trump. I handed him and I said, look, we don't want any, you know, just, just give them to them, okay? A couple months later, Boss joined a few other congressmen in the Oval Office for a bill signing. And the president looks at me and goes, boss, boss. He said, prayer cards. I went, yeah, Mr. President, we sent, we sent, my wife did that and circulated prayer and prayer cards. And he said, we use those. And I said, good, I'm so glad, that's wonderful. The president then asked for the bag of cards off a shelf so they could take a picture. He said, understand we use these. And I turned and whenever I turned, I ran, honest to goodness, chest to chest with the pr vice president. And he goes, Mike, he's not joking. We use these. There'll be times we say, okay, and he, we reach out and we grab them. It is amazing that people are willing to put these together. Tracy was elated to learn he actually read the cards. I cried and I still get emotional about it. I'm thankful that every day he gets to put his hand in that bag. And I know the right card for that day is the one he puts in his hand. And so were Andrea Deming's students who wrote cards. Even those who told her they didn't like the president. We encourage them that you know, just say positive things. Um, if you had a specific prayer for him or a specific scripture or something that you would like to say that's positive, but we were strongly encouraged them to keep it positive. And, and they all did. There were none that were um, rude or anything in that matter. Cassandra Ortez, who now helps collect the prayer cards, tells CBN News she was worried about President Trump because she didn't know where he stood spiritually. This experience has eased her concerns. To know the word of God is being spoken, it's being taught, it's being reflected on, it's being meditated on in the White House. It's just a huge encouragement to you know, know that God is working, God is moving in the White House. She believes there is power in believers joining together to send prayers to our leaders. So many people, you know, we don't want to be the silent Christians. We don't want to be the ones that, you know, see the issue, complain about the issue, and then don't do anything about it. Congressman Boss says prayers and faith are an integral part of his job. I don't know how anyone does this job or any other job without a faith, 
that is strong uh, and without the prayer and support of other people. And he thinks many Christians would be surprised to learn how much prayer happens daily in the Capitol. There's never a day, never a morning, never uh, sometime during the day of any day that we're there that there's not at least one or two Bible studies or prayer groups. Of me. I was so overwhelmed with the amount of faith in D.C. The boss still deliver about 100 prayer cards each month to the White House and now collect them from all over the country. Tracy encourages people not just to write prayers to the president, but also the vice president, the first lady, or any other leader God is putting on your heart, like a mayor, a state senator, or a city councilman. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. That is encouraging. Mm -hmm. Even it? if you don't like, you pray, things will change. God puts kings on their thrones, mm -hmm. and takes them down when they're not doing it right. You got well, it. We want to close our time with you today with this scripture from Psalm 103. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things that He does for me. He is a good, good Father. He loves you so much. Ephraim and I thank you for being with us on today's 700 Club Interactive. Bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.